morning and welcome to the True Disciples broadcast. For the next 30 minutes, my goal is to inspire you, to educate you, challenge you, and hopefully for some of you to activate you into a confidence of taking your Christian faith and engaging your culture. My name is Pastor Kevin Baird. I am the lead pastor of Legacy Church here in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm also the director of the South Carolina Pastors Alliance, which is a network of now close to 300 pastors, and we're growing, linked together here in this state, networking in order to use our influence for faith, family, and freedom. And I am so glad that you're tuned in to this station today and you're listening because we've got a great show for you today. I have a great pastor friend of mine here today, and some of you may know him because he has been in the area for an amazingly long amount of time in fruitful and productive ministry, Reverend Pastor Dr. Bobby <laughs> Eubanks. I'm so glad you're with me today, Pastor Eubanks. I'm glad to be with you and look forward to hearing what we're going to talk about today and uh, excited being a pastor in the Low Country for these 28 years. Absolutely. And uh, you really are, I, I call you, I know you wouldn't uh, call yourself this, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you the title, a general in uh, a lot of the cultural engagement issues, especially in our era. And uh, maybe as we get started, because we're going to jump into uh, some pro-life issues, talk about uh, abortion in this state here in just a moment, but maybe it would be good uh, just to introduce yourself, uh, tell us how uh, you, you, you got to pastor real quick, and especially how pastoring turned into sort of a, a call to engage the culture on, on moral and, and religious freedom issues. Okay. I uh, received a call to, to preach the gospel in 1979, so I've been pastoring for 34 years and pastored two other churches, uh, attended Charleston Southern, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and Luther Rice Seminary in Atlanta. And uh, from the beginning, I've, I knew that God had placed in my heart a concern for the culture, not just to be in my pulpit in the four walls of the church, but to challenge the people, but if there's an opportunity to speak to the darkness and light a candle, uh, you know, I saw that as my calling as well as preaching and proclaiming the gospel, kind of a prophetic office or a prophetic gift. Because some people say when they hear prophecy, they think, oh, he's talking about the future. And no, no, no. If you read the Old Testament, the prophets are very clear. They spoke out against the darkness of Israel. And uh, so prophecy is a two-edged sword. Yes. And I have the aspect of ethically challenging it with the light of the gospel. Yes. Well, and what many did not know, and I did not know it till I met you. In fact, it was interesting. One day I got my face in the newspaper, and, and I remember at that lunch you said, there's there's a young man I can identify with. He's, exactly. he's taken some heat, because I know you've taken some heat oh, yeah. uh, through the years, but you actually ran for governor of this state. Yeah, I was a writing candidate because Governor Beasley had said he would help us with the issue of abortion and from a governor's office and at least be a spokesperson. They don't have much you know, legislative authority, but they do have a, a voice. And he completely ignored us on his second term. So a bunch of Christians or Republicans around the state said, you know, they had enough of him. And, and so they wrote my name in. And so that gave me the opportunity to get on the radio and talk about these issues. And I flew around the state with some people. And it was a great experience. Uh, I had no desire to be in, in a political office. Uh, however, I, I learned how the machine works. And it's ugly. And sometimes it's not as pretty as we'd like for we think that it is. And many times our issues that we value, like protecting human life, are put on the table, you know, in exclusion to other projects and things that they feel like are more monetarily, you know, available to South Carolina. So, you know, I don't regret doing that. I, my deacons allow me to do it. My church, they voted for me to do it. And uh, we didn't get many votes, uh, didn't even get on the radar. Um, but at the same time, we did get our message out. And I have newspaper clippings and things from that era. So it's a, it was an interesting time. Not something I, I prayed about. I prayed about a long time before I did it. And that's something I would volunteer for tomorrow, but at the same time, uh, somebody had to stand up because in the darkness there has to be light. Yeah, well, I work with pastors, and, yeah. I, and I know certainly you have as well. Uh, any of us that have uh, a couple decades under our belt usually find ourselves helping or mentoring other pastors right. along the way. And one of the things that's interesting to me is that uh, many think this is really a, pol a political call. You know, I've been called the political pastor, that's and my funny. response is, no, I'm not political, I'm faithful. Um, but but th they don't realize that this is a scriptural or a theological foundation for us to be able to speak and to present our value system uh, to the culture as a viable alternative to the other values that are getting thrown on the table and discussed as to what's going to be codified as our 
our nation's, you know, value system. What direction will our nation go? And and you were in the front line on that, I know, uh, for so many years. Oh, yeah, I got criticized. And, when, you know, we lost a few members over it, but we had people come. And uh, because they say, you're a political pastor, I've never told anyone how to vote. You know, if they come to me and ask me, I'll tell them who I'm voting for and why. I do preach on the values, and I do call out those people in the political realm who are opposing the Christian values. I'll call it, you know, the president or the senators or whoever. And, you know, people say, well, that's not biblical. Oh, really? Uh, John the Baptist yes. lost his head because yes. he attacked the ethical yes. issues of, of the King Herod. Jesus uh, referred to Herod as a fox, and he attacked the Pharisee establishment, and he referred to them as vipers. So, you know, I'm in, in good company, and he said that, you know, throughout the Bible, if, if we're doing what we're supposed to do as Christians, we're going to light candles. It's going to push the darkness back, and they're not going to be happy. Yeah, it's amazing to me that you you can't go through the Bible, particularly the uh, Old Testament is is ripe <laughs> with examples of prophets uh, walking straight into throne rooms and uh, speaking to the kings with regards to uh, what the word of the Lord was at that particular time, and then to suggest <laughs> that we have no place scripturally to do these sorts of things because it's like you said it's it's dirty. I've heard people say that. Well, pastor, it's it's you know, it's it's an evil, it's dirty, it's it's all these sorts of things and you know, you can just kind of see them just kind of cringe, but there there has to be that light and that salt that enters into even that arena. Well, you have to understand too, culturally America has shifted from not being a biblically based culture to a non-biblically based culture. Yes. And part of that is they tell the pastors and Christians, stay out of the politics, let us run them. Well, let me give you an analogy. If you hired a cook and she was cooking for you every day and you notice after three or four days your stomach wasn't feeling very well and you said, well, I just got a virus and, and then maybe one of your family members got it. So a few more days went by. And then after a couple of weeks with this cook, you started getting real ill, ended up in the hospital. And then after a month's time, you and after a while, you, you come to the conclusion, maybe I need to see what the cook's doing. And same thing with politics. We put these people in the office. And, and we're getting polluted type government out here and it's hurting people, the, you know, oppressing people, killing babies. And, and then, you know, we need to put people in our government who are Christians. And so if we if we exclude ourselves from this, who's going to take over our government? Well, we see what's happened. And they've told us for years, pastors, stay out of it. Churches don't get involved. Don't. And that's really what hell would want us to do is get uninvolved because he'll put his people in power. And the result is we get what we got. Exactly. I would love, and we'll do this again sometime, okay. because I know in the next uh, two programs you're going to be with me, uh, obviously, <clears throat> on this program, and then uh, you're holding over as well, so you'll be on next week, so we can let our listeners know that, uh, that Dr. Eubanks is going to be with us next week as well. But we're going to have to get together again and talk about the Johnson Amendment in the IRS Code, because that's one of the greatest uh, mythical laws that exist out there that silences pastors from speaking right in right. this area so but we're, we're talking about the abortion issue today because you have been a general in the pro-life movement i know you have had not only yourself but your people out at the abortuary here in charleston we have the largest uh abortuary in the state unfortunately uh three of them and uh, we're doing our best to uh, bring light into this culture of death. And why don't you just share with the folks that are listening how you got involved in this particular issue? Well, when I first got here, um, there were some issues that came up in some people in my church who had had some situations with children that were considering abortions. But anyway, I found out that the abortion clinic was in Charleston, so I tried to form a South Carolina Pastors for Life chapter in South Carolina in the Low Country. They have one in the upstate. Uh, it was a complete failure. I sent over 300 letters to pastors, and I got like six responses. But anyway, from those six pastors, we started going to the clinic, and Kevin was not here at the time, and there Kevin Baird was not there. But uh, we got a few pastors to go, and we would take a few of our members, and we would go once a month, and they would take one Saturday, and we'd take the next Saturday. And we did that for like 10 or 12 years. We started getting harassed by the police department. Uh, we got harassed by the uh, uh, owner of the clinic who – uh, hired thugs to spit on us and yes. you know call us names and things like that and but we kept going and then finally it got so bad that uh, we were getting too much exposure uh, in a negative sense a lot of my people quit going and then I had some health issues and I had to back off from going so much but I've been in fighting through the state legislator I've been fighting you know on the media newspapers rallies you know just like you and it's been a blessing to have you come in the area because I took a lot of heat and flack for the my stance but, you know, I've been involved for – the clinic's been there 28 years. I've been here 28 years. 
and I would dare say since its inception, and I found out about it, um, back when I first got involved, there was over 10,000 babies a year aborted in South Carolina. And uh, that number has dropped significantly, but it's still too high. I think it's in the 6,000 range. It is. It's it's somewhere above 6,000. 3,000 here in Charleston, yes, I believe. Yes, and we carry, unfortunately, The, half the largest of number here. Yes. But a lot of these babies who are boarded here are out of state. I've seen young girls go in there. I've seen uh, what one black lady told me, African-American lady told me, that uh, she saw a gentleman pull up with a BMW and put out a young, take a young black girl in, and she said, that's our local pimp. I said, how do you know this? She said, we know. And I'm thinking to myself, we've got all kinds of darkness that's connected with the abortion industry besides, you know, just the ones who want to abort on de- demand. There's like that guy showing up with the girls that he uses and how he does this legally. You know, it's under the radar. But this clinic um, right now is being supported. I don't know if I can say this right now, but it's yeah. being supported by MUSC. Uh, they're having a hard time getting doctors here. But MUSC it has some kind of partnership and we're trying to unravel this. And it's appalling that tax dollars are being used by by us to support MUSC, who's sending doctors over there to kill babies. And I know Kevin is as deeply involved in as I am about seeing this come to an end. Absolutely. You're listening to the True Disciple <coughs> broadcast here on WTMA 1250. My name is Pastor Kevin Baird, and it's my delight to have a guest with me today, Dr. Bobby Eubanks from Ridge Baptist in the Somerville area. Uh, I have uh, called him a general in the area uh, for cultural engagement, and certainly in this area we're talking about with regards to abortion. You know, I've been in the area for 17 years, and um, it's an embarrassment in some ways uh, for me to even uh, admit this, and, and, and yet hopefully maybe if there's another pastor listening or someone that it will assist them. But, you know, this this death mill was in my backyard. I mean, uh, our church was located not far from that location, and um, we were there for years. And I don't; it just didn't dawn on me. I, 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 it wasn't on my radar, and suddenly it became on my radar. And then it just plagued me. I, it, all of a sudden, it just dawned on me: how could I allow, as as a servant of the Lord and and a pastor of a church, and all of the verses that affirm life, and and all of what <clears throat> we initially talked about, which calls us to engage darkness with light. How could we allow child sacrifice? How could we allow the altars of Moloch to to stand in our own backyard? And something gripped me uh, just several years ago, and um, I just said, I can't, I just can't sit idly by and, and watch this happen. And so uh, I just kind of jumped in, not knowing really what I was doing at the time. I just jumped in and and from that, I've, I've got to, to meet wonderful people like you and others that have been faithful uh, in, in this particular area. But you bring up an important subject because this came to our attention, that we have this prestigious, elite medical university. I mean, uh, we would say without question, and I'm sure you would agree, that they do incredible things at that university with regards to saving children's lives and helping children and healing children and the list is endless it's it's prestigious not only in our state but even in our nation and so we have every right to be proud of of our medical university here in the low country but all of a sudden it came to our attention that there was this link that was taking place with regards to them funneling residents uh doctors over to this private abortuary and then we began to do a little research, and we found some things out that were actually, it, it gives every appearance, at least at this point, that's against the state law. Maybe maybe you can tell us a little oh, more about that. Oh, it's definitely against state law. You can't use tax dollars in any form or fashion uh, to support any abortion in the state. That's a private matter. A person has to do that on their own. An OBGYN, there are abortions performed in our hospitals, I think, last year, 40 or so. And those were life-saving abortions. But abortion on demand is a different animal because that's basically a, a woman can come in and if she just doesn't want the baby, she can go there. And so what happens is they can't get doctors at this abortuary, but MUSC is providing a OBGYN staff and those resident doctors as ones to provide for the abortions, which illegally, according to state laws, illegal. Not only that, we had an employee who worked there who anonymously sent us some information that they, she knew for a fact that the tissue, that is the fetal tissue, uh, which is Latin for baby, so I might as well say it, baby tissue, yes. uh, was being sent back to MUSC for research. And that, too, is illegal. 
and you can look at the side door going into the mortuary, and there is a box there where they collect uh, samples and send them back, and, and they have a, a vehicle coming from MUSC that picks all this up. Not only that, my question is liability-wise for the state of South Carolina. If a girl dies from a botched abortion, and that does happen, though rare, it has happened, or she's injured uh, lawsuit-wise, you know, what's going to happen? And when we ask these questions to our state officials, we're not getting too much help. We're getting a little bit of help from some people, but not the kind we need to stop this. Right. And, and we want to come back to that because <clears throat> right. I, I really believe that this program and the next program, we, we, we want to... We have worked behind the scenes. I, I can tell you, Dr. Eubanks <laughs> yeah. has worked hard behind the scenes. I know what I've done behind the scenes, talking to our uh, legislators and uh, governmental officials, trying to get people to <clears throat> look into and confirm some of this. And, and we w- really want to get into that. But I wanted to put out the Guttmacher latest, the Institute's latest statistics on abortion, which were remarkable. And, and you can Google me, check me out, 98% of all abortions that are taking place are purely convenience abortions. Think about that number, 98%, which means that 2% of all abortions fall within these anomalies, which we would call uh, uh, rape, rape, incest, incest life or, of the mother, these, right. ki- these kind of abortions, which, which are worthy <laughs> of a public discussion. But 98% of all abortions that are taking place are purely convenience elective abortions. Now, the reason I'm, I'm speaking slowly <laughs> and articulating this is because the point that I'm trying to make is we have state laws that have clearly said, as South Carolinians, we do not want our tax dollars. I do not want my tax dollars. I know you don't want yours no. to go to underwriting in any way, shape, or form the industry of convenience abortion that's taking place. And we're finding out that this simply is not the case. And, and what people don't understand is abortions hurt women. Uh, being a pastor in this area for 28 years and pastoring for 34 years, I can't tell you how many times I've had women up in age who have carried this burden of guilt that when they were young and foolish and made a decision to abort their child or were forced by their boyfriends or mothers in some cases. And then only to find years later after they had children and grandchildren, the, the oldest one I had was 63 years old and she came forward one morning. And I counsel with her, and she for received forgiveness. Because, you know, God's not going to send you to hell for having an abortion. Uh, you know, if you can become a Christian and accept Christ. But so many times we're, we don't realize it hurts women, both physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And some women feel like they can't be forgiven. And our message is a message of hope. And so Absolutely. if we can end this evil or at least get it down to a, a situation where women can make a right choice, and the right choice would be to save that baby. If you don't want the baby, uh, there's tons of people. I got some in my church. Absolutely. That they have adoption agencies. I can get you in touch with them. There are people who'd love to have a baby. So women get under these pressures. They make a foolish decision. It hurts them. It, it ends the baby's life. And, and it, it disobeys God's law for life. Absolutely. And, you know, sometimes the response <clears throat> uh, from the uh, pro-choice community is, well, are you going to adopt it? Or and, and my answer is, I just may. But... The, the fact of the matter is, I know in our churches alone, I could line up probably 20 to 30 people with, within a half a day of, of making phone calls. Mm-hmm. I have people that know what we're doing, know what we're about, know the stands that we take, and they've looked at me and said that if there's ever a girl who changes her mind on the doorstep of the abortuary, I will take that baby. I, you know, I, I, I've got people, professional people, doctors, um, lawyers, people who would say, I will mm-hmm. step in and do this. So... There, there is an incredible community of life out here. Some of them can't have children for whatever reason, and they would love to have the opportunity, no matter uh, how that baby came about in that, that girl's mind, they would love to have an opportunity to raise that and, and give it a quality of life. And well, not only that, we've got the Low Country Crisis Pregnancy Center that has a phone system where you can, their number's in the phone book, I don't have it with me right now, but you can call them at any time and get help, and they will actually assist you in doing all of these things plus provide training food diapers bottles the whole nine yards plus they have training for the fathers of the children and to help you stay together as a couple or if you're not going to stay together to you know do what you should do in your responsibility as moms and fathers 
And that's a great organization. Yes. Our church supports that heavily because not only do we curse the, the the darkness, you know, but we also light candles in the darkness. And I believe that agency does a great job. And, and I appreciate them, and we pray for them and financially support them. So there's no reason for a baby's life to end. And, and even if it has a deformity, there are those who will adopt those children, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. And people don't realize that. and say Because, you know, the first thing the doctor says, you're going to have a, a child that's not 100% normal. So the, probably you need to consider abortion. And doctors do that in counseling. You need to say to them, no, if God gave us this child, there's a way and a plan. If not us, then there's somebody who this child was meant for. And there's all kinds of resources, you know. Absolutely. And, and, and again, that's not to say that I have heard, uh, you know, medical community doctors uh, say this is what it looks like. And then all of a sudden the baby's born. And for whatever reason, that it wasn't, there. It wasn't that exactly. way. Exactly. And so that's, that's certainly not to uh, besmirch or in any way undermine uh, what, what medicine has uh, been able to do for us. I'm just saying that, that, that that's not always the last voice. In, in these particular situations. Again, you're listening to the True Disciple broadcast here on WTMA, 1250 AM, and my special guest with me today is uh, Dr. Bobby Eubanks from Ridge Baptist. Uh, Bobby, we're going to pick this up again in our next program, so we're going we're gonna to be able to get into this, but I'm holding in front of me all the materials from MUSC from a Freedom of Information Act uh, request. Um, Interestingly, um, there is uh, a, a, re- a lot of redacted material uh, for various reasons of which we don't know. But uh, one of the things we do know in all of this material that I'm holding here is that uh, our medical university is at the very least supplying doctors. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken on this, that uh, one of the professors actually goes over and participates and uh they are underwriting the insurance as well as the workman's compensation. So monies are, are without question flowing that direction, which is helping underwrite because all of those things are necessary to operate a freestanding abortuary. So monies are flowing from a state university uh, to help our <coughs> local abortuary here. And as we've come to understand state law, you just can't do that. Well, the average calls for just a, a, I guess you say up to the twelfth week for an abortion. My understanding is around eight hundred dollars. Uh, it's escalated in the last few years because of costs, you know, going up. But if you stop and think about that, if you have to have a medical abortion late term, uh, the costs are can get real high, and they're underwriting all of this. And my concern is, you know. Are they counseling with these young women? Are they trying to find other means? See, they're not providing the support that we would or the Low Country Pregnancy Center right. would, you know, because a lot of these young girls are in desperation. And you're right, money is being used illegally to support this industry because without their support, this abortuary, and it is a private abortuary. See, it's not property of MUSC. I mean, if the building burnt down tomorrow or blew up or whatever happened to it or if an earthquake opened up and swallowed it, the building, you know, there would be no liability to the MUSC. But if a young girl's life is taken over there by a botched abortion, as I mentioned earlier, then we still don't have answers on what is the liability. We haven't seen contracts. We haven't seen uh, any information about, you know, how we're going to deal with issues that happen over there and what effect would it have on the taxpayers. Right, and we've had DHEC requests go in as well. Just trying to figure out: Are there de- has there been DHEC violations? Has there been right. are, are they operating according uh, to law, according to standard? I mean, obviously, yours and my philosophy is we we don't want this here. I no, mean, that's ultimately that's here. my philosophy is we don't want it here. But but the fact of the matter is that that at this stage in our culture, there are laws that have been erected with which to provide as much as I distaste it you know, uh, abortion on expectations. Demand. Yes. Exactly. And, and, they, and they've got to adhere to those particular expectations. And the reason they don't is because they probably wouldn't be in business if they had to measure up to all that has been put out there legally, uh, for, for them, uh, to do. And so, you know, we just, we just feel like that this is probably the greatest cultural issue of our time. This is the greatest human justice issue of our time. And, um, you know, for I, I liken it to this, I, I, I liken the abortion issue in some ways to slavery. And, and we all think slavery is absolutely abhorrent and evil. And it boggles the mind to think it even existed in this nation now. 
But there was a time it existed. And there was a time it was allowed legally to take place. There was a time when those who would even challenge it were looked at as religious nuts and fanatics. And, and to imagine now the state not only uh, 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 regulating that industry of slavery, but underwriting the purchases of, <laughs> of whips and other, uh, uh, other things that would take place. I mean, it, it, the, the analogies are legitimate, and it just simply boggles, boggles the mind. Oh, I agree with you totally. And, and, you know, we're not trying to go against a Supreme Court ruling, though I disagree with the Supreme Court. But it is a law, as they interpret it. What we're trying to say is, is that if there's going to be a private abortuary, let it stay private from all directions. Absolutely. No state funding, no state support, and no assistance of any kind. And then let it stand on its own two feet. And it can't. Not in the culture. Where, I've been hearing statistics where things are changing, and, and it's good because more and more people are keeping their babies. And these clinics will go out of business, but this one won't. As long as MUSC supports them, it'll always be there. And and our premise is it shouldn't be. It should be private and not public. Yes, and when we uh, when we are on our next program, we want to get into some of the, <clears throat> the roadblocks that we're facing in this particular area. So if you're listening today, and by the way, we're at a brand new time. This is 8 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. And so uh, hopefully uh, our folks, were got, we got the message out there, so hopefully many people know that. But uh, this is just the start of what we want to talk about. So uh, 8 o'clock a.m. next Sunday morning, we're going to be right back here on this particular topic. But Dr. Eubanks, I want to say thank you. The 30 minutes we spend talking goes super fast, but we're going to pick it up from this point on our next program. We'll recap for just a moment, but uh, we want to get into... Uh, who who who's stopping this? Why can't we get somebody to look into what's going on here? Because uh, somehow things have to change. By the way, why don't you tell us real quickly uh, where Ridge is located, and if people are listening, they want to come okay. see you or visit you. Tell us about it. We're in Somerville. You come up uh, I-26 from Charleston, get off exit 199, go about two miles. We're on the right, off the road, about a third of a mile. You have to turn down Ridge Church Road, easy to find. Uh, if you're coming from Munts Corner, 17A, same thing. Uh, take a left this time. And uh, church has been there since 1872. Sunday was our homecoming, 142 years that we've had a congregation in that area. I look, I've been there most of the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've done well for 142 years. That's hey, that's great. That's excellent to have a witness that has uh, gone on for that long. Well, again, we'll pick it up with Dr. Eubanks next time. But let me just say to all that are listening today, I'm so glad you tuned in. Hey, you can check us out at one of two different places. You can go uh, to my website at Legacy Church SC, like South Carolina, LegacyChurchSC.org, or you can go to SCPastorsAlliance.net, and you can find out more about how pastors are connecting all across the state of South Carolina. Of course, you can go to YouTube and find all of uh, our uh, uh, media there, as well as past programs of this network. Um, just Type in my name and Legacy Media, and it will get you there. Hey, we're on Twitter and all the sorts of social media, so you'll find us if you want to find us. But again, tune in next week. 8 a.m. is our new time, and uh, I am so glad you found us today. Hey, and I, as I always do whenever we end the program, I always remind you, take your faith out into the public arena, and you keep walking the walk. People need to see real, live, consistent uh, Christians living it out, and uh, we're to shake the salt and be the light in our culture wherever God may put us. And remember, you keep being a true disciple. This is Pastor Kevin Baird. Until next time, thanks for listening, and God bless you.